So today we're going to talk about tips and tricks for implant restorations. The first thing I want to uh, just make sure that everybody follows us on all our social media platforms. Uh, you can uh, follow us on uh, YouTube uh, under the same name, Romero Dental Seminars, on Instagram and on Facebook. I want to uh, thank our sponsors for making this webinar series possible. This is now our third year doing our tips and tricks webinars and uh, Colty and all the arts have always been part of this journey and I really appreciate their, their support and, uh, and I want to make sure that all of us, uh, everybody that is listening here, uh, you know, can reach out to these companies and, uh, and make sure that they, that you can say thank you to them because they're the ones allowing us to do this for free at no charge. Uh, and we do it multiple times a year. So thank you again, Coteen and Oral Arts. Uh, you can also visit our webpage, www.romerodentalseminars.com. If you visit our webpage, you will find this link uh, called webinars. And under that link, you will have uh, our uh, other links. Uh, the first one being the live webinars where you can subscribe or you can uh, uh, make sure that you register for future webinars. We're gonna have at least, I think it's six or seven webinars this year. And you can also click on the On Demand button where you will have a link to uh, that is that is connected to our uh, YouTube channel where you will have um, the opportunity to review any of our previous on, uh, webinars that have been recorded. Uh, so there's a lot of topics out there. Uh, you can choose, we have 70 videos up to this point, so you can choose from any of these topics uh, and make sure that you just review them and please uh, share them with your colleagues so that our channel and our community continue to grow. One more thing, if you visit our YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe to our videos. Uh, by doing so, you will get uh, uh, email alerts so you would know exactly when one of our new videos comes up uh, and, you know, and you can always then watch the video and, and continue supporting our channel. So my objectives for today's presentation are, first, uh, we're going to understand why restoring existing teeth prior to implant planning is important. How to correctly use a stock abutment for final restoration. How to best manage peri-implant tissues in the aesthetic zone. Understand the clinical management of the overdenture patient with locators and learn how to effectively manage blade implants over dentures. So let's start with our first, with our tip and trick number one, the pre-surgical restorations. Now, the reason why I wanna talk about this tip and trick is because I have seen uh, many, many cases and many dentists, you know, work up their cases. And for some reason, we're all really adamant and we're, pushing to, you know, getting that implant in the bone because it's going to take some time for this implant to, and the site to heal. And we, and, and we then think about, you know, other restorations that our patients may need in order for us to, um, to kind of uh, uh, restore the case. Uh, but honestly, um, I think that we always, we should always start by the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is definitely never the implant. The bigger picture is the actual stomatognathic system, the way that this system is going to perform and the way that the system, the entire system, will allow this implant restoration or multiple implant restorations be part of the system. So when you keep that in mind and, you see, and, you, and, and, and you're seeing one of, one of my cases, you can see that this patient came specifically because he was missing tooth number 10. But at the same time, I want you to see what is going on only if, if, we, if we just consider the aesthetic zone, what's going on with eight and nine. Uh, so definitely, if I want to restore this case and I want to make sure that that implant is correctly placed and the space, the restoring space that I have for the implant um, would, would match the contralateral lateral incisor tooth number seven, I have to make sure that I complete the mesial, that I can restore eight and nine to the ideal mesial distal width. That is the important key to understand here. And this is, this is true for any big case. And I consider any big case when you need to restore more than one tooth. So if you need to restore, and if you're trying to restore, you know, or aesthetically improve a smile, 
you got to make sure that you get you get the height to width ratio at uh, uh, you know ideal height to width ratio before you go ahead and plan any of your implants because obviously the location the ideal location of that implant is going to be based out of this analysis and these previous restorations that you're going to have to do for the patient. So I'm not going to talk about surgery today, but I just wanted to show you a little bit about the case. This is what the patient, this is how the patient presented. As you can see that he had a large cyst in the area of number 10 that we needed to remove. We needed to graft that area prior to us even thinking about placing an implant. So because of that, we went ahead and we grafted the area we suture the area, we allowed that initial grafting to heal. And while that was healing is when we started working on eight and nine and getting that mesial distal width, the correct mesial distal width on eight, uh, uh, of eight and nine prior to us planning, you know, waxing up, getting, fabricating our guide for the placement of implant on site number 10. Again, this webinar is only on the restoration or restorative part of, of implant dentistry, but we do have a webinar where we discuss everything you need to know about anterior composites or layering composites. So I would highly recommend that you watch that webinar. Again, it's a free webinar. If you have interest on, you know, how do we uh, go about restoring with direct composite, just like we did here for this particular patient on eight and nine prior to us, you know, continuing treatment. So now you can see we've allowed three to four months to go by. We've allowed that, that uh, the, uh, the grafted site to heal, the grafted site to, you know, the, the bone graft to, to generate and regenerate bone in that area so that we can go ahead and place an implant on site number seven. As you can see, patient was also missing some mandibular incisors. He had a, uh, a uh, bonded, a uh, three unit temporary bridge that was placed by a previous provider on the mandibular arch. You can see that the patient is a smoker. You can see the stains, the nicotine stains. So there's a lot that we need to, that we need to work with this patient prior to us, you know, advancing and progressing with this treatment. This is what was our starting point. Our starting point was let's give him back a smile. And then we're little by little going to, are going to start working on other sides of his mouth. We're gonna, this is, this is definitely going to be a, 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 a full mouth case. But what I want you to see and what I want you to, uh, uh, and, the, and the reality of general dentistry is that in many, many instances, we have patients like this that come to our practice and they cannot just, you know, start and finish their entire mouth in one, you know, in, in, in one treatment plan. Sometimes we have to break these treatment plans in multiple phases so that patients can afford our, our, um, our procedures. So in this particular case, we decided to work uh, with the aesthetic zone first. And again, you can see now eight and nine are restored. This is the actual uh, uh, suck down that I fabricated out of a wax up just to kind of get the buckle and the link contours of tooth number 10. And this is going to serve as my surgical guide. And you can see my implant was placed and I'm going to now suture that area. I'm going to allow the implant to heal. And in the meanwhile, while everything is healing, I already have restored seven, I'm sorry, eight and nine which obviously allows me, let me go back one, allows me not only to place the implant in the right position, but most importantly, allows me to complete this aesthetic zone restorative work with in an ideal situation. And I'm gonna show you on the second part how the case was completed. But most importantly, right now, my tip and trick number one, you finish your restorations, you plan your case, you finish the restorations of the neighboring teeth at least, you plan your case, you plan your implant, and then you go forward and restore the case. So now with the same patient, we're going to restore this patient using, and this is my tip and trick number two, using the stock abutment. And again, there's multiple ways of doing this. I'm going to show you all the ways that you have to restore implants. So I'm not going to talk just about, you know, custom abutments. I'm going to talk about every single way you can do this. So now we have waited maybe four to six months. Patient, the implant has healed patient is ready for restorations. We're going to make an impression of that implant using an, uh, an impression coping. You can see the restorations on eight and nine. They've been, again, this patient is a smoker. You can see the staining of the composite, but you can see how smooth, how highly polished they are. You can see the textures that I was able to achieve around the composites, the line angles, the well-defined line angles. So again, these are good restorations 
that have allowed me to place the implant in the correct position, knowing the mesial distal uh, prosthetic space, the real mesial distal prosthetic space that I would have for an implant after I restored tooth eight and nine. And here is my impression, and I'm going to now remove the impression, unscrew the, uh, uh, the, the impression coping, retrieve the tray with the impression material, send this to the lab. Now, if I'm going to use a stock abutment, like in the case that I am sharing with you right now, I'm always going to send that stock abutment to the lab, and I'm going to have my lab person prep that stock abutment. So as you can see on the photo on the left side, he, he prepped a very shallow uh, chamfer around this, this, um, this stock abutment so that he could finish his metal. This is a PFM crown. He could finish the metal. He had enough shoulder thickness for him to finish the metal, thick porcelain on that area so that I don't see any metal through the porcelain. But at the same time, he's going to indentate or mark what, what is the buckle aspect of that uh, custom abutment. Now, I know that many people like prepping these custom abutments themselves, and I don't have anything against that. I think that that is a way of saving money if you if you want to call it, if you want to give it a name, you know, you do it yourself. I'd rather send it to my lab. He knows exactly how much room he needs. He knows exactly what he's trying to achieve or accomplish with the PFM crown that he's going to build for me. I'm more than happy to send it to him and make sure that he makes all this. He gives me a lot of detailed information within that stock abutment. Once he fabricated the stock above me, he went ahead and fabricated his PFM crown. You can see another view of the stock abutment. This is the chamfer that he was able to create slightly subgingival. And this is another good thing that I like because when he, because he's preparing this stock abutment, I, he, I only want him to be maybe half of a millimeter below the gingival margin. That gives me a lot of room between the base of that stock abutment and the actual platform of the implant. Because again, when we're thinking about cementing a crown, and that's what I'm going to be doing for this particular case, when you're thinking about cementing a crown, you got to make sure that you choose the right case for that. You don't want to have, ideally, you always want to sink your implants and you want to have two to three, I would say three to four millimeters of tissue thickness around the implant so that the platform of the implant is away from that shoulder that the lab has created, at least two to three millimeters, and that way you don't have any risk or you or you lower the risk of having any cement, um, you know, going below that area and closer to the platform, platform of the implant that can definitely affect the implant long term. And you can see here a, a lingual view of the PFM crown with the ideal contours. So now we are at the clinical phase. We get the crown back in, in, in the office. We're going to go ahead and deliver that stock abutment. You can see stock abutment goes all the way in. You can see the little chamfer that the lab had prepped around it being slightly subgingival. We have this mark in red that we, we, we know it should be facing facial. We're going to then pack once we torque the abutment. We're going to pack in, and I like using Teflon tape. I just pack it in that access hole so that I don't get any cement around my screw. And in this particular case, because I have a really long abut and the friction between the metal of the PFM crown and the metal of the stock abutment is, is very high because of the length of the stock abutment, I'm only going to use temporary cement to cement this crown on that abutment. This crown, when I was trying in this crown because of the length of the abutment, and again, because of that uh, that in intimate contact between the metal of the crown and the metal of the abutment, I could barely remove the crown from the patient's mouth with my hands without any cement. So I knew that by using a temporary cement, I was going to get a good, nice seating and secure crown seated on that abutment. And at the same time, it would allow me to retrieve their crown if ever needed in the near future. Uh, this crown hasn't been retrieved. We haven't had any needs to retrieve it. It's been in place maybe now for, I would say, six to seven years. You can see the high staining that the lab was able to create, very natural restoration. Even though it's a PFM crown, you can see the translucency effect, good management of the ceramic of the porcelain. And that has a lot to do with the ideal preparation of that stock abutment. And that is the reason why I prefer my lab to prepare the stock abutment. 
I don't want to do it myself because I want to make sure that they have enough space for everything they need to, to, uh, to recreate a natural looking tooth. On the patient's smile, on his side, you can see he's got a low, a low smile line. So the, the gingival de or the, pair, the, 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 uh, the soft tissue defect that he had in the area is non-visible whatsoever in a full smile of a patient. You can see my combosses are still hanging in, a little bit of staining here and there because he is a smoker. But you can see how beautifully the crown, the PFM crown, was able to bio-integrate in the patient's smile. And again, this is because we gave the opportunity to the lab to prep that stock abutment and have it, and create enough space for them to give us back a restoration that even though has some metal substructure, it, it does look very natural within the patient's mouth. So let's go to our tip and trick number three, which is tissue management in the aesthetic zone. So this is a, this is a patient that I received uh, when the patient got into my chair uh, or came for her first appointment, she had had num tooth number eight extracted. That tooth had a fracture. And what you're seeing here is that the dentist, uh, the restorative dentist at that time, they extracted the tooth, they placed an implant. His periodontist placed an implant. And the restorative dentist used the same crown. The tooth had been restored with a porcelain crown. The same crown, they just sectioned the root and they attach this, the natural crown of the patient to the actual uh, a temporary abutment of this, of the implant. And the idea at the, at the beginning was just to keep that nice anatomy of the gingival tissue. So this is a retracted view of the day that the patient sat on my chair. You can see this is a, 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 a ceramic restoration on a natural tooth. Again, they sectioned the root. They adapted this natural restoration with some flowable composite to the implant. And you can see the gingival contours around that implant. This is probably four months, four to six months after implant placement and immediate loading of the implant. Now, when we look at this photo, you can see that there is really very little keratinized tissue around this crown at this point. You can see the redness of the tissue. You can see that the color of the tissue is not this pink, uh, uh, pale pink. And, and it doesn't have any, any of the dotting of the, of the natural um, orange type of skin that the, that the keratinized tissue uh, has or pitting that the, the tissue has uh, uh, around healthy tissue. You can see that this tissue definitely looks different. So at this point, you know, I'm, 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 telling to the, I'm, I'm talking to the patient. Patient has a fairly high smile line, very, very high aesthetic demands. She's a very young patient. And I understand. So I'm going to go ahead. You know, her chief complaint at this point was that she was really not happy with the aesthetics of this tooth. It was shorter than the tooth before, than the tooth, uh, the adjacent tooth. And I explained to her that there was a reason for that. No, they shortened that tooth because it was an immediate, uh, 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 temporary place I, I, immediately after the implant was 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 placed. So she she understood that aspect, but she wanted at this point with the implant being integrated, she definitely wanted something that matched better. At the same time we were not ready for a final restoration. Again, look at the tissue. Look at the lack of keratinized tissue, which is the most important thing around an implant. Uh, and, and, and for aesthetic reasons as well, you know, you don't want to have this, this redness around this crown for the rest of the patient's life. This is the time to work around that. So I went ahead, I, uh, and this is just a side view so that you can see uh, what I was, what I was trying to, to, to uh, uh, you know, make my point about the tissue, the thickness. You can see how thick the biotype is around the natural tooth and how thin the biotype appears to be around the implant and the, and, and the temporary crown. Again, this is another retractive view. We're going to go ahead and now remove this as a lingual view. You can see that they had created an access through the uh, natural crown of the tooth. That's what they use for their temporary. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, what I did is I sent the patient back. I did not remove the temporary crown at that time. And I sent the patient back to the periodontist and asked the periodontist, what could he do to improve this? Can he, can he add some uh, 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 you know, a gingival graft in this area to improve the keratin, you know, have more nice tissue around it? So this photo was probably taken three months later. So three months later, the periodontist went back. He did a, um, a soft tissue, connective tissue graft so that we can now get some 
of keratinized tissue building up in this area. You can see that he did a really good job thickening the tissue. You can see that the gingival zenith and the gingival contour now looks a lot more similar to what you see on the on the on tooth number nine. So this is very important. And these are the things that us, the general dentist, we have to make sure that we view these things. And for me, the most important aspect of this case is definitely the photography. Because you know, sometimes we oversee things when we're in the clinical chair with our patients. By taking photos, sitting down and analyzing the photos, there's a lot more that we can capture. And you can see the difference between the pre-op photo and the situation that we have right now. So at this point, you know, three, three months, uh, the periodontist, I think that he had me wait three to four months in order for me now to retrieve this temporary. You can see how he was able now to match better the thickness of the tissue. From an incisal standpoint, you can see how thick the tissue is now around the implant. And it kind of simulates what the patient had around tooth number nine as well. So now we're able to remove that temporary. And again, you know, I want to applaud the uh, initial work of the restorative dentist that had the idea of using the same tooth as a healing abutment, if you want to call it that way, because you can see how beautiful this tissue has healed around that implant. And this is what we should be looking for. And the other thing that I want you to see here is look at how deep the implant is. I mean, this implant was placed maybe two to three millimeters uh, apical to the CEJ of the neighboring tooth number nine. And that is ideal because again, this is where if you ever want to cement a crown, you got to make sure that that platform is way I mean, it's deep within the, the bone and the tissue so that your restorative platform, which is the one that the lab fabricates for you in a custom abutment, and I'll show you what I'm referring to that in a future case, that restorative margin is far away from that, from that, uh, from that aspect of the implant. Now, obviously, you can always do a screw retain restoration if the implant is in perfect uh, 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 position. You can use a, 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 a screw retain restoration or you can use an angular screw channel. So there are many restorative options today. Uh, again, I'm just talking about all of them that are, that are out there. So now you can see here, this is the, the uh, free gingival graft. I'm sorry, this is the, the, the graft, uh, the added uh, 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 tissue graft that the periodontist had added. And you can see how thick and beautiful the tissue is, nice and healthy around that area. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a brand new impression. And in this impression, you see that I'm, 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 I'm using flowable composite to copy the architecture of that sulcus, to copy what the previous dentist worked really, really hard to achieve. I want to make sure that I keep it there so that I can then, you see here, I know that I have enough support. Look at the gingival zenith. Look at the gingival architecture around the, the site of the implant and look at the gingival architecture around the natural tooth. So this is what this this is what uh this right here is what my impression coping with flowable composite looks like underneath the tissue now i want you to look at something when i send this to the lab we're going to fabricate a new temporary for her but when i send this to the lab you can see the distance between my prosthetic margin and the the actual platform of the implant this is very important because when we're talking about the dangers or, 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 or the, you know, the issues, the problems that you can have if you get cement around the implant, that cement has to be around that platform that is at the bone level to create issues. If you used a, a custom abutment and your implant was correctly placed and you can now uh, place your restorative margin more coronal, you're not going to have the same, you're not going to have those issues for sure. You're going to have better access to remove and clean any excess cement that you may have around your restorations. So you can see this is what the impression looks like. This is after connecting the impression to the analog, the impression coping to the analog. You can see that with flowable composite, we were able to obtain a very detailed impression of the sulcus. And I wanna just stop for a couple of seconds here because I do wanna go back one photo and just show you, just, just explain to you one thing. I When I place the impression coping, I go ahead and I dry as much as I can the sulcus and I inject the flowable composite directly to the sulcus. Now, because I'm using a really good amount of good, a good thickness of flowable composite, I'm sure that again from the buckle and from the lingual and I know I'm going to cure. I know that not all that flowable composite is going to cure as well because of the thickness of that layer. And we all know that it all depends on how much 
depth of cure you have with your resin restorative materials in order for them to polymerize completely. And the depth of cure, it's approximately two to three millimeters. And you can see that I have a lot more than two to three millimeters here. So what I do is I then unscrew the custom, the impression coping, and then you unscrew it, even though the inside of that, of, 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 of this coping is not, the flowable composite is not going to be completely cured. It is, it is in a, in a more uh, a solid state. So I go ahead and I remove it and then I like cure it directly outside the patient's mouth. Once I do that, I add a very thin layer I, outside the mouth. I add a very thin layer of flowable composite around the entire uh, um, impression that I just obtained. And using a micro brush, I make it nice and smooth and then I light cure it again. Then I go back into the patient's mouth. This is what you're seeing here. I go back into the patient's mouth. If I have too much pressure around the tissue, and you will identify that because you will see the tissue blanching, you retrieve the, the, the impression coping and you just cut back a little bit of the flowable composite and you try it in again. You have to make sure that there is no excess pressure around this tissue. And you can see here that at this point, right before I make my impression, there is no excess pr uh, uh, pressure around the gingival tissues uh, surrounding that implant. So this is the final impression. And this is now my final restoration. I'm sorry, my temporary restoration. This is a lab fabricated uh, 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 composite, milled composite restoration. Now you can see that the lab has copied in this emergence profile, they have copied the information that I sent them in that impression that I obtained with the flowable composite. And now that's what you're seeing here. They do a soft tissue, uh, pour, and then they add flowable composite until they get this to to uh, fit and, and, and be in intimate contact with the inside of the sulcus. And this is, again, this is after I receive the temporary restoration. And you can see the nice support that I, this in, in temporary restoration is giving the tissue you can see the nice pink color of the tissue we can now see that there is more of a keratinized type of tissue around the implant but now we have to wait and i always recommend in cases like this that are very they're they're highly, highly aesthetic if your patient is very very demanding please take your time if you put a final restoration immediately on this site, you will be surprised how much recession, what, what are the possibilities of having some recession, even though the tissue management by the periodontist has been so well done. And I'll show you that. For this particular patient, you can see this is immediately after the uh, connective tissue graft with the previous temporary. And this is today with my temporary and after the connective tissue graft. So this is immediately after, and this is probably four to five months after the connective tissue graft. You can see the gingival zenith. They both match very, very well. They're right at the right height. But again, I was still, because you can see the difference between this photo and this photo, I was still a little bit hesitant to, to go further and take my final impression for my final restoration. Now, this is a side view again. Remember how we started. You can see this tissue more depressed. Now this tissue more, you know, bulkier. Uh, you can see there's a lot more bulk. There's a lot of there's a the tissue appears even visually just to be healthier overall. And this is from the left view, for, and you can see again thicker tissue, and you can see the lack of tissue on uh, when we started with this case. This is. From an incisal view, I want you to see the depression that the patient had, and now I want you to see this photo over here where they're more, they're even. You know, the, the, you, you can see that there's an, uh, 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 there, there's been an improvement here. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to seal, we're going to uh, um, torque that temporary, and we're going to seal the axis. But this is a photo taken eight months later. So eight months after we delivered the temporary crown, this is still the temporary crown. But what are you seeing here? You're seeing a little bit of recession. So again, for this particular patient, 
we decided to wait because we knew and she had expressed to us from the beginning that she wanted this to be perfect. She wanted this to be the best outcome possible. And you can see, if I would have placed a final restoration on this tooth, I would still see a little bit of that recession. So there is still something that we need to do here. We either need to, you know, most likely the easiest thing would be just to, you know, remove a little bit of the tissue around tooth number nine. And we're still debating that, but this is just something that I want, I really wanted to show you because this is the reality of clinical dentistry. And this is the reason why for cases like this, I like waiting. I don't rush through them. I like waiting because my goal, and I know that my patient's uh, uh, desires are to get the best result possible. Now, the question always comes, and you can see from an incisive view, really good match, really good line angles, beautiful temporary. But again, look at the little recession here. You can see a little bit of an inflammation around the tissue, around the crown. There was a little bit of plaque, and I did tell the patient that she needed to improve the hygiene in that area. But again, she has a little bit of recession. We have to deal with it at this point. Now, the question always comes to me, can you, do, can you use this same technique for, for posterior teeth? And the answer to that question is 100% is a, a yes. And I'm gonna show you this case. And this is an immediate implant placement. You can see I'm gonna remove this tooth. I'm gonna place my implant. I'm gonna graft the site. And I'm gonna suture and I'm gonna allow this to heal. Once the tissue heals, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do exactly the same thing that I did for the previous patient. The only difference is that for this patient, I'm not going to build a, a full temporary restoration. All I'm going to do is I'm going to fabricate this emergence profile shaper or this tissue contour or this custom healing abutment. Now, in uh, today, uh, today, what I'm doing is that immediately after my surgery, I already have one of these uh, tissue conformers fabricated. So I'm going to place it and I'm going to suture around it, which is the best way to do it because that allows you, that's one less appointment that you're going to have to do later. But this is just a, an older case of mine where I was doing it in two separate stages. I had my healing abutment. I removed my healing abutment and then I delivered this custom healing abutment. Now, because this is a custom healing abutment that I'm placing after healing of the tissue has occurred, I have to expand the tissue little by little. The beauty of doing it the way that I'm doing it today, that I'm actually fabricating these custom healing abutments, and I have I have a, a, a little printed guide with the different shape of different teeth in the mouth with different sizes, small, medium, and large. So I have, you know, I have tissue conformers for first molars, for premolars, for central incisors, for lateral incisors, for canine. All the emergence profile of natural teeth are actually developed in this little guide that I have where I just inject a little bit of flowable composite, put one of the uh, uh, temporary abutments in, like here, get it out, and I'm ready for the day of surgery. The day of surgery, I'm placing this custom healing abutment and I'm placing my sutures right around it so that, you know, maybe three, four months later when I'm ready to restore, the tissue is also ready for me to go ahead and make a new impression, just like you're seeing right now. You can see, and I'm going to remove that for you. And this is what I was able to achieve. Look at that beautiful tissue uh, contours around the implant. And again, look at, look at the depth of my implant. You know, maybe there's, there's maybe three to four millimeters from the gingival margin all the way down to the platform of the implant. And when you make an impression of this and you send it to the lab to fabricate a custom uh, uh, abutment, this is what a custom abutment looks like. You see, now the lab is able to place their prosthetic margin for the final restoration wherever they want. And obviously the easiest place to place it is slightly below the gingival margin so that you don't see the metal of the abutment. Now I like using these uh, these um, these uh, gold type hue type of abutments because obviously they, you know they, they, it doesn't look gray and the tissue still around it is gonna is gonna what, what you're gonna see through the tissue is gonna be more of this yellow type of appearance. So I like using this, but this is not something that you need to do. It doesn't make any difference, you know, uh, if it's just metal color or any other color that you want to use. On these abutments but the most important thing is where the the margin is located so you can place it slightly super gingival on the lingual aspect and it's slightly sub gingival on the buccal aspect so that you can hide that transition but again if you think about it i'm approximately 
three millimeters away from the platform of this implant. So if I'm going to cement this crown, and I am going to cement this crown, I'm going to have I'm going to have really good access to the prosthetic margins. Very easy removal of any excess cement. So very little risk of you getting any cement. I mean, it's almost impossible to get any cement underneath the gingival margin and getting it all the way down to the platform of the implant because you have access right here. Now, again, there's a lot of techniques out there. I'm not going to talk about that today, but there's some techniques out there, very good techniques out there. Today, there's one, you know, where they print it. You can have your lab print uh, on a 3D printer something that looks just like your abutment. And then you can use that to remove the excess ins of, of cement inside the crown. You can place the cement in the crown, sit that printed abutment, remove it. Now you have a very, very thin film thickness of your cement on the crown, and then go ahead and deliver the crown directly onto your abutment. Obviously, after sealing that access with Teflon tape. This is an occlusal view of the final restoration that was fabricated. This is a zirconia. Uh, a full counter zirconia restoration, very nicely stained by oral arts dental laboratories. They're the ones that do all my restorations. And, and you can see here the beauty and the natural look of these restorations. We make any minor adjustments in the occlusion as needed, and then we highly polish them and we go to the next case. So let's go now to our tip and trick number four, clinical management of the overdenture patient. So for the overdenture patient, it's you know it's it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, there's a lot of these cases that I manage myself that I do all the extractions and I place the implants. Some other cases I rather refer them out and, and I normally work with a periodontist. This particular case was done with my real good friend Dr. Roger Arce, who is a periodontist out in the Texas area today. He used to be here in Augusta, and this case is one that we did together. Uh, this patient, we, you know, we we did full mouth extraction. He did all all full mouth extractions. He, he regularized the bone and then he went ahead and placed two implants for an over denture on the mandibular arch. So you can see this patient was completely collapsed. We needed to alter vertical dementia. There was a lot of things that we needed to do for this patient. So we went ahead because of the conditions of his teeth. Patient did not want to you know, spend any money on an immediate denture. He was okay. I mean, he wasn't, you can see that aesthetically at that point, uh, the way that he was doing. So he was okay just, you know, being without a denture for three to four months. So we went ahead, Dr. Arce went ahead, removed all the teeth, placed the implants. And once the implants were placed and we allow for good healing of both arches of the tissue, we're going to now start with our, um, with the, the, the workup for our dentures. And again, this is, there's many ways of doing this, but I just want to share one way that I like doing this. And, and I'm going to share with you why I like doing it this way. So I don't use the regular wax rims that are fabricated by the lab. I use these sectional wax rims. This wax is a very thin wax. It's probably two to three millimeters buccal lingually. Uh, 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 the thickness is only two to three millimeters from the buccal to the lingual. And the reason for that is because I'm using a technique where I use process base. So the base of the denture where this wax is being attached is actually the final base of my dentures. So I have a process base that the lab fabricates. That's my first flask. And that process base is fabricated right on top of the cast that we obtain from our final impressions. Then I attach this very thin wax from canine to canine only on the front of the, of, of the upper denture. And I have, and I start having this patient smile and have some phonetics because I want to make sure that I'm trying to, I, I want to make sure that I, create and I, I, I place my incisal edge in the best phonetic and aesthetic position. So I want to make sure that I'm looking at all the functionalities of my denture from this wax rim. And you can see that I'm trying to measure here. I have seven millimeters, eight millimeters from the lip. So when he smiles, he's going to display approximately eight millimeters of, of the tooth, which means that he has uh, average smile line because this patient, if a tooth is 10 millimeters, his lip is going to cover approximately two millimeters of that tooth. And I'll show you that, uh, how we, we, we transfer that information to the denture in a minute. But you can see we're having, we're having the patient have a conversation with us, you know, say multiple words with M, with S and with F. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce. You can see that I've now reduced a little bit the length of the wax so that I get it to the right spot. So now you can see that he's smiling 
and he's literally touching the incisal edges from canine to canine. So I'm trying to shape that wax rim, that very little thin wax that I have only from canine to canine. I want to make sure that I get it at the right length so that I know exactly and I can communicate with my lab, hey, this is exactly where I want my incisal edge to be placed. So now I've marked the midline, I've marked the canine line, and we go ahead and we do now the lower, and we do exactly the same thing for the lower. You can see how thin this wax is. It's a very little, it's a very thin wax rim. We have the midline here, and now we want to say, we want to say Emma, 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 and just relax the lip, and we want to see two to three millimeters, two to three millimeters of the incisal edge. If we see more than that, we go ahead and just reduce a little bit the height of that. So this is giving us that information that sometimes can be difficult to share with the lab. And we're going to tell the lab, this is exactly where I want the incisal edges of the maxillary anterior teeth to be located. This is exactly where I want the incisal edges of the mandibular dentures to be located. Now, this technique was not developed by me. This technique was developed by Dr. Uh, De Rosa. Dr. De Rosa is a faculty member uh, at Eastman Institute for Oral Health in the AGD program. And it, it, me and Dr. De Rosa actually published this in a compendium in, I think, in 2016. So you can probably get this article for free uh, if you Google it. Uh, and, and it's an easy way, a uh, very predictable way to communicate with the lab and, and, and to get and, and, to, and to kind of work around your dentures in a way. You can see how my mountain is now. I have the incisal edges of the upper teeth located. I have the incisal edges of the lower teeth located. All I have to do on the back now is add a little bit of wax. I don't allow that wax to touch. Have the patient swallow and then attach all these, both of these uh, 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 bases with uh, Regisil. Now we're getting our denture teeth trying. So we get all this, inf we give all that information to the lab. We know exactly what we're looking for. We know exactly what we want. We tell them, we measure, we tell them this is what we want the incisal edge. This is the size of the teeth that I want you to use. I select, personally, I select the teeth that I want them to use based out of the analysis that I just shared with you. And now we're going to have our patient, this is the wax trying on those, uh, 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 on the denture basis. And again, we have the patient smile. We have the patient do phonetics. Same thing that we did with the wax, we're going to do now with the teeth. And my goal, when I take these photos, I want to see exactly, I want to see the same relationship between the lower lip and the incisal edges of the maxillary anteriors. And I want to see the same relationship between the inci incisal edges of the mandibular incisors and the lingual aspect of a maxillary incisors. That should not change because that's the information that I share with the lab. And you can see the process base is in place. He's waxed the teeth right on top of the process base. And now I'm doing my wax trying. So the beauty of this is that because you have this process base, this base is your final denture base. So it fits like a glove. It gives you ideal stability to make all these tryings. The patient can literally have a conversation with you because this is the final base of the denture. So the patient, you're not going to redo that. All you're going to do is do a second flask of the teeth and the tissues to that uh, process base. And that's something obviously that your lab has to understand this technique and has to be able to perform it. So you can see here, now he's done his second flask. He flasked the teeth to my denture bases. And then I went ahead and pick up, picked up the locators. And we went from what you see on the left side to what you see on the right side. But the tip and trick here is the way that you measure this incisal edge location, the way that you, that you really place them in space so that then you can share that information with your lab and try to prevent from having multiple appointments, try to prevent from having you to kind of uh, move around teeth because you, you know, they were not in the right position. If you give your life the right information, they should be able to deliver, to deliver a, a denture that, is, that doesn't require multiple appointments. Now, today we're doing this a little bit different. I haven't completed a case yet to share with you, but I'm working with one of my residents right now, and I, I hopefully in the, in the near future, we're going to share her case with you where we're using the same concepts, but with the, in, in the digital world. So we're now trying to make it even, quote unquote, faster by using digital means instead of analog means. <coughs> and you can see the upper arch from extractions to the full healing. 
And let's go now to our tip and trick number five. Clinical management of the blade implants over denture. And there's only one reason why I want to share this case with you. Because today our patients are living a lot longer. This patient presented to our program with a 35-year-old maxillary and mandibular arch blade implants. And for the young dentists out there, you know, we have to you we have to learn how to deal with these patients. Even though we're not using blade implants anymore in dentistry today, or at least not that I'm aware of, you know, we still have to know how to restore these cases. And we were lucky enough to have this patient sit in our program, sit in our chair after uh, 35 years of these implants being in service. And, you know, when you look at the tissues around these implants, you can see that whoever did this surgery and restored these cases, these two dentists, if there were two dentists or one dentist, I don't know about that. They did a great job. And the beauty of this is that when they did this case for her, they literally fabricated two sets of dentures. She wore the first set of dentures for the first 10 years. She wore the second set of dentures for the, for the next, I would say, maybe 20 years. And then she came to us and we did her third set of dentures. Now, because she had two set of dentures, and you can see this is the denture number one. This was the oldest set that she had. That was the set that was given to her the day that the denture was delivered. And this were the newer set that was given to her maybe 10 to 15 years after uh, the first set. She started wearing that, that, that newer set. That is the set that she was wearing when she came to us. But she had saved both. So what we did is that we asked her, can you bring with you the first set? So she next appointment, she came back and she brought the, new, the oldest set, the one that you see on the left-hand side. And what we found out was that when we placed it in her mouth, there was still retention. So the, ble the bars, the metal bars that were fabricated for this blade implant was still working perfectly. So we did not have to fabricate any new metal components for her denture. We actually used the oldest set in order for us to fabricate the new dentures. And I'm going to walk you through that process. So the first thing that my resident, this is Dr. Cassandra Liston, and I'll, I think I have a photo of her in just coming up in a minute. She was the, the, the resident that was treating this patient. Uh, and you know you can see that she had with the oldest older set of dentures, she had a 67 millimeter vertical dimension, which obviously means that the teeth were worn down when you compare it to the to the newer set of dentures where her video was 70 millimeters. And I think that with, with Dr. Liston, uh, we decided to increase the vertical dimension. So we added some wax to the, uh, to the actual dentures. We added wax to the occlusal surfaces of the older set of dentures. We increased the vertical dimension maybe by... I, I think it was three or four or five millimeters. And now with that new vertical dimension, and this is Dr. Liston, now Dr. Mitchell, she's married now, uh, but she practices in South Carolina. She was the one that managed this case. She went ahead and started communicating with the lab. And this is really where the tip and trick comes. You really have to develop good communication skills with your lab. Your lab technician, the one that does the dentures for you, they have so much experience they have seen so many of these cases that they will be very helpful to kind of guide you through the process. So what we did is that we sent all these photos to the lab. We sent the older set of dentures. We knew that the metal housings inside those dentures worked very well. And we just asked them what would be the best way for us to kind of, you know, make an impression so that of the bars so that you know exactly where to, where to place them. We said, no, don't do that. Just use the old set of dentures and make an impression with them. And that's what we did. So we did border molding with the oldest set of dentures. You can see the bars inside the dentures. They were working perfectly well. Once we border molded, we went ahead and we did the same. With, I'm sorry. We did the same with the, with, the, uh, with the lower arch, border molded everything. We did a final wash impression using light, using light material. Again, making sure that the dentures connected very well with the bars. And then, as I said, we added wax. We had added wax. We did this previously. We added three or four millimeters of wax so that we increased the vertical dimension of the older dentures so that the pin would come down and we would allow for, you know, for 
She wanted, the patient wanted bigger teeth. She wanted teeth that she can really show. And, and, and literally, she actually told us that when the dentures were new, she liked her teeth because they were larger in size. So these had a lot of you know significant wear, I would say, after being used for such a long time. So we increase the vertical dimension directly onto, onto the dentures. We use the dentures as everything, as our trays, as our wax rims. We, we mounted this. We obtained a face bow. And we got a bite registration and centric relation. And then we mounted this on an articulator. We sent it to the lab. What the lab did that he burned out all the acrylic, the old acrylic, set the blades, waxed on top of them, added the teeth. And what he did, he used uh, he used acrylic to re replicate the blades on the impressions on the cast, and then he sent them right back to us. We went ahead, we fit them in because we were using the same metal housings that were in her previous denture. They fit just like again. The retention of the dentures was ideal. It was the aesthetics and the wear on the teeth that the patient wanted different. So here you see our wax try-in. Bigger teeth, the way that she wanted. She loved her new teeth. We were taking photos from the side. We make we made very small adjustments. We sent it back to the lab. The lab went ahead and flashed these dentures for us. And you can see this is the old housings that were kept within the denture. And then they were delivered and adjusted the occlusion to a lingualized occlusion inside the patient's mouth. Made sure that you know that she had a, a really nice balance, lingualized balance occlusion. And this is now the patient's final smile after delivery of the upper and lower over dentures. Look at the nice lip support. And you can see on the left-hand side is the old denture, the oldest of all the dentures. That, that was the one that we used to remove the, the, the metal housings. And on the right-hand side, you can see the new smile with the new teeth, exactly what she was looking for, exactly what she wanted, wider, uh, larger, and brighter teeth. And this is a view from the side. You can see very nice aesthetics, very nice uh, function as well of these dentures. The incisal edge located exactly where we needed them. And that's my last tip and trick for the day. So I'm going to go ahead and open now uh, the Q&A.